It's a pleasure to welcome Barbara Tillman as our first speaker of this year's NAR Music Conference. So actually, I met Barbara 20 years ago in San Antonio when I was a postdoc with Larry Parsons, and she was interviewing for a job in music cognition at the University of Texas. Um, I never really saw her again, so I kind of assumed that uh, you know she didn't get the job. But I just found out yesterday for the first time that she did get the job, <laughs> and she turned it down because she was waiting to hear for another offer from uh, Lyon, and so. I guess I, I didn't, didn't know that story until yesterday, so anyways, <laughs> I, I, think, I think you made the right decision um, in the end. So Barbara's from Germany, but she spent most of her career working in France, and so from 2007 to 2020, she directed the Auditory Cognition and Psychoacoustics Research Group at the Lyon uh, Neuroscience Research Center. More recently, she's moved about two hours north to Dijon, and so she's working now in the laboratory for research on learning and development at the University of Bourgogne, where Emmanuel Bigon is uh, the main researcher there. So Barbara's research deals with the domain of auditory cognition quite broadly, using behavioral neuroimaging and computational methods. She investigates how the brain acquires knowledge about complex sound structures for both music and language, and how this knowledge shapes perception and memory, notably uh, via expectations. She's probably best known for her work on implicit processing of music, including uh, priming paradigms that we all, we all know about. She actively investigates the connections between music and language, including studying people with congenital amusia. Isabel Peretz is here, very happy to see Isabel as well, talking about amusia, um, as we heard on her, in her colloquium on Thursday. Um, her research also investigates how music can stimulate cognitive and sensory processes, including um, in pathological populations. Barbara's very, very prolific. She's published 168 peer-reviewed articles, three books, uh, 28 book chapters. She's won numerous awards, including medals from the CNRS in France. And then the end to my story is that Larry Parsons, who I knew from San Antonio, ended up retiring in Lyon. So that created us like a San Antonio-Lyon connection. Last time I saw Larry was in, was in Lyon. I didn't see you there. Um, but there's kind of a weird cycle that we go from San Antonio you go to Lyon, and then my, my postdoc supervisor moves there to retire. So anyways, Barbara, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming, and we're very happy to welcome you to NeuroMusic. So I will talk about research investigating the potential influence of a rhythmic auditory stimulation on language processing, but it's motivated by the observed link between rhythm processing in music and speech for both uh, competences and deficits. So I'm here with a special day on the developmental language uh, disorders in music, so I will focus on developmental lang language disorders, so the link between music um, and language. And I will present fundamental research with perspective for stimulation training and rehabilitation. So it's based on the more broad research in neuroscience and music, making the link with um, language processing. So you find similarities in acoustics and similar um, structures. So we don't pitch, timbre, or rhythm dimensions or the syntactic structures. And then there's numerous research showing or suggesting shared cognitive and neural researches between music and language processing and a potential benefit of uh, musical expertise, either uh, musical training in everyday life or then musical stimulation or training programs um, established during the research, research program. But I want to focus on rhythm today, okay? And I propose to you to look on the material first, so the rhythm in music and in speech, and then the processing of the rhythm in music and speech and the involved mechanisms, and then coming to the priming stimulation paradigm uh, I announced earlier. So if we say rhythm in music and speech, let's make a Simple definition first, so if you say rhythm is the temporal patterns that, the pattern that is created by onsets and durations of acoustic events in a sequence. So in music, there's pretty clearly established rhythmic patterns with underlying regularity. So if you take a simple melody, you have your amplitude waveform, and then I can code it as a rhythmic pattern with events that are more or less long, long, short, long, short. 
And the specificity of the music is that the brain can abstract an underlying pulse or beat that is regular on isochronous. And it doesn't stop here. We have a hierarchical structure with a metrical structure where some events are more important or accented in comparison to others. Music, the structure is pretty clear, but you can describe similar structures in language material. So here there's sentence, you can line out the syllables, and then also have a hierarchical structure with a stress level. So we can define similarities between music and speech, so based on the acoustic cues, so duration mainly, but then also frequency or intensity, and the hierarchical structures, which are particularly interesting when you think about temporal predictions, both in music and in language. And then obviously there are differences, right? The regularities in music, as I said earlier, are clearly established, so they are isochronous underlying beat. While in language, it's more the pattern of um, uh, prominence of the grouping of the syllabic stress that creates this rhythmic dimension. So with this in mind, for the similarities and the differences, come back to the question of the processing rhythm in the two types of the materials, okay? So we can observe links between rhythm processing in music and speech, both for competences and for deficits. Though there are research now showing that there's a link between musical training and phonological skills. Or musical rhythm discrimination performance can predict grammar skills in both children and adults, as the seminal work of Raina Gordon has, has shown. So here, based on the competence. Then you can shift to the um, deficits, right? Other research here for the pre-readers, poor beat synchronization is linked with poor pre-reading skills, like phonological processing or rapid naming tasks, for example. I can push deficits a bit further and then talk about deficits in rhythm and meter processing and pathology, like children with developmental language disorders, or SLI, as it was named previously, so speech and language impairment, a specific language impairment, but also with children in dyslexia. So for both populations, there have been a link between performance in rhythm and meter processing tasks, so with nonverbal material, and language processing tasks. Like, for example, the performance of the children um, tapping to a metronome can predict rhyme awareness, spelling, or word or non-word reading performance. Or then even if it's around beat perception performance, so extracting the underlying beat, it, it can predict word, non-word reading performance. So we have competence in the deficits, and the link between the rhythm processing and music and speech is further enhanced. That um, if you focus on um, populations with a deficit and you train the rhythm capacities, you can see benefits in language processing. Like, for example, here two examples on dyslexic children, where rhythm training programs led to benefits in phonological awareness and reading performance. So what kind of mechanism might be underlying this link between rhythm and music and speech processing? So we propose that could be conceptualized in the framework of the dynamic attending theory of Murray, originally proposed by Murray Rees Jones, postulating that auditory attention is a dynamic phenomenon that is guided by temporal attention over time. So the hypothesis is that there are internal oscillators that synchronize to external regularities in the environment. So if you have an isochronous sequence like here, you have our attention is oriented over time and can be at several hierarchical levels, so covering different time spans and allowing for the development of expectations about the temporal occurrence of the next event, either at short span, time spans or longer time spans. And there are numerous research out showing that there's facilitated processing for events that occur in a regular structure in comparison to an irregular structure. And that processing is facilitated for events that occur at expected time points in contrast to early on late. And this is observed not only in musical material, but also for language material and different aspects that you can um, study. So word, syntax, or semantic processing, but also for the learning of new structures or new grammars or artificial languages. Okay? And all these activities involve perceptual and cognitive sequences and benefit from temporal attention. And this might also be relevant for language processing, in particular if you think about phonological processing, syntax processing, or even reading. So now with this in mind, I propose you to go back to this link between rhythm processing and music and language I exposed earlier. This led us to ask the question, might it be possible to use musical rhythm and meter with clear temporal regularities to drive this internal oscillator and benefit to this temporal attention and this could then benefit to subsequent language processing, for which, in language, the temporal regularities are less clear. Okay? So this brings us to our research question that I want to 
um, with the research domain that I want to present you now is the, can the rhythmicity of a musical prime influence subsequent syntax processing? And we were interested to look in this also for children with DLD or dyslexia for uh, whom there have been deficits reported for rhythm and meter processing. So this is the general underlying paradigm. The children listen to a short musical rhythmic prime and then subsequently do a language task. And this rhythmic prime was played by percussion instruments and it was um, organized in such a way that it was e either easy to extract an underlying um, metrical structure, extract the beats and the metrical structure, what I call regular sequences, and then contrasted to the irregular sequences where the events were shuffled around to not be able to extract this underlying part. So just to give you an idea how this first material um, sound that we were using for, So short little excerpts like this, about 30 seconds, and then in contrast to the irregular ones. Okay, stop here. And then afterwards, the children listen to sentences, short sentences that were pronounced in a natural speech. Um, and then they were asked to do grammaticality judgments on these sense, on each of the sentences. Um, together with a cover story of a, a little dragon, half of the sentence were grammatically correct and half were incorrect. And during the experimental sessions, they listened to a musical prime, have six sentences to judge, another musical prime, and so on and so on. And we were interested, so the hypothesis was, is, will there be better performance for this grammaticality judgments after the regular prime in contrast to the irregular prime? And we analyzed this with signal detection theory to contrast whether it was really a, an increased sensitivity to detect this ungrammaticality or whether it was just introducing a bias. And I want to insist here that there was no much one by one between the rhythmic structure of the musical material and the accent structure in the sentences because it was naturally pronounced sentences and there were six sentences following in music. So it was more a priming on a more global abstract letter, level. Okay, so it was always the same music and then six sentences. In the first experiment, we tested um, children with DLD, with the phonological syntactic syndrome, and we compared them to matched control children, either matched for chronological, chronological age or for reading age. And here you have the result pattern, so it's the higher the better, so you can see that the chronological age matched children obviously performed the best. Um, in contrast to the DLD and the reading age children, but all children showed better performance after having had the regular musical prime in comparison to the irregular prime. And based on this, so we went to the second uh, study. We did the same experiment with dyslexic children, also matched with the chronological age control children and the um, reading age children, and we see about the same data pattern, except performance was less low. Um, but again, as well for the dyslexic children and the control children, we see better performance after the regular prime in comparison to the irregular prime. And interestingly, this effect of the musical prime was not accompanied by a difference in response bias. It was really just the performance to make these grammaticality judgments that were seen. So a first answer to my question, can the rhythmicity of a musical prime influence subsequent syntax processing? I can say yes. And not only for the control children, but also for the DLD and the dyslexic children, have a benefit of this having listened to the regular prime, um, despite the patient's deficits in the rhythm and meter processing that have been reported previously. So since this original study, this effect has been replicated also in English, because I didn't mention it, that the first study was done in Lyon, so it was in French, and then replicated in English, then also by um, uh, Iniko Ladani in Hungarian for DLD children, and then we did it in French with adults with more subtle syntax errors too. So as I said earlier, also music is not at the same time like the language. It's really the effect of the prior stimulation on the subsequent speech processing, and it was a priming on an abstract rhythmic level, and not matched one by one to the rhythmic pattern of the syllable accent structure. So this result pattern is in agreement with data of patients with basal ganglia lesions and Parkinson's disease that Sonia Kotz had reported earlier across two different studies. So basal ganglia lesion patients, um, when they listen to grammatical, ungrammatical sentences to the 
They don't show the typical P600 effect in an ERP response in comparison to a normal population. So that was her earlier study. And then in a newer study, then she presented a um, regular musical prime before presenting the sentences. So it was like a March music. And this listening to this March music before the sentences restored the P600 in this basal ganglia patient. So it was a comparison across the two studies. So we were wondering now, can we replicate this kind of cross-study comparison? Previous patient group did not show the P600. I listened to, they, I present the March and then uh, P600 emerged. Can we replicate this in the same um, participant group? And, um, to show whether the rhythmicity of your musical prime influenced the P600 for this ungrammatical detection. We tested it with dyslexic adults and their controls um, uh, in contrast to the basal ganglia patients. So we had the dyslexic adults. They were all university students and participated in another larger project about uh, dyslexia um, at university. And um, they mainly showed phonological difficulties. So it was um, phonological dyslexia or a mixed form, but they all showed increased reading times for pseudo words um, or irregular words, and we had reduced orthographic skills. However, there were a normal range for nonverbal intelligence or normal reading comprehension performance. And as it has been tested earlier for children, here we wanted to test their rhythm processing capacities with a series of tests focus, um, tapping into rhythm production or rhythm perception like um, tapping to a metronome, tapping to music, or the beat alignment test, judging whether the sound of a metronome was aligned or not with the beat. I don't go into the details of these results, just to show that the task that I put in red, uh, the dyslexic adults were impaired in comparison to the controls. Because the main fo focus of the study was obviously to go back to the rhythmic priming paradigm uh, where we compared the regular and the irregular music followed by the grammaticality judgments. And here we used more varied musical uh, primes. This time we worked with a musicologist, with percussionists, to make the music mm, more different between the different primes, but more interesting too, and but also more complex, but always with the constraint that um, has clearly established beats. Examples, I have clearly the regularity, um, but a bit different. Oops. And now it's playing two at the same time, so it is awesome. Okay, so, and here's a little other effects. So during the experiment was one different series, so it's just two examples, just to have more variability, and then the irregular sequence. And the um, young adults here, they also did the grammaticality judgments. And overall, even if the mean performance in the B prime was a bit weaker for the dyslexics in comparison to the controls, it was not statistically significant. But what you can see, it was mainly that the dyslexics, they missed some um, ungrammaticalities in the sentences in comparison to the controls. And we also had an additional test with more subtle morphosyntactic errors in French. And here, both groups were lower in performance, and here the dyslexics were significantly below the controls. And what is interesting for the purpose of today is to say that we had correlations between the syntax ta tasks performance and some of the rhythm perception and production tasks. So in agreement with the research I presented you at the very beginning, mainly for the children. Okay, so what is with the EG data? So we observed the P600 for the grammaticality errors for both the dyslexics and the controls. For the dyslexics, we observed a later peak at the posterior sites in contrast to the controls. But the interesting point is to say, well, we have this interaction between prime and grammaticality, and the difference between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences is bigger after the prime, regular prime in contrast to the irregular prime. So an effect on the P600 from the preceding prime. So we also observe an enhanced P600 after the regular prime versus the irregular prime in the dyslexic adults and the controls. We have some impaired performance in some of the rhythm perception protection tasks for the dyslexics and a link with the syntax processing. And since here the uh, dyslexics, they also, we had the EEG recording also during the prime presentation. We were interested to look also at the 
um, EEG while the participants were listening to the musical prime, wondering whether they were processing differences between the dyslexics and the contractions. So <clears throat> obviously the same paradigm because the same data sets. Um, and here we run a stimulus brain coupling analysis for this auditory rhythmic stimulation, so a um, coherence analysis. And what I plot you here is the power spectral density for the musical material. So we have peaks at 4 hertz, so it's in the acoustical signal, at 8 hertz, and at 2 hertz where the beat was, the beat frequency that the brain was supposed, or the listener was supposed to extract to get the underlying pulse, there was some energy, but it was not as high. So it's interesting to see whether nevertheless we can see in the coherence analysis a 2 hertz activity match after the regular prime in contrast to the irregular one, even if the energy was rather low. And here it's interesting to compare this to other unrelated frequencies like 1.3 or 3 that are neighboring frequencies with about the similar um, power, but unrelated to the supposedly relevant, perceptually relevant 2 hertz frequency. What I want to show you now is the difference between regular and irregular for the dyslexics and the controls. So here I have the results of this coherence analysis. So for 4 hertz, you see clearly increased um, uh, coherence after the regular and irregular, also strong acoustic activity in the primes, also for the 8 hertz and for the 2 hertz. And it was observed for both groups, for the dyslexics and the controls, and there was no difference. What is interesting now is to compare this 2 hertz result with the result at 1.5 or 3 hertz, where the power was similar, but now no difference between the regular and irregular condition. <clears throat> so here we looked at the difference, regular and irregular, and you see the response of the brain to this, uh, the acoustic energy, but also to the underlying emerging 2 hertz pulse. So now we wanted to look also at each condition separately. So here um, I plot the coherence as a function of the frequency for the region of interest that you see on the top left. And in blue, you see it for the controls after the regular prime. So we have the peak at 8 hertz, at 4, and at 2. And in green now, same condition, but for the dyslexics. So they show the same three peaks, perhaps, well, a bit weaker for the 2 hertz, but not significant, perhaps also because the groups were not there very uh, large. Um, but the same pattern for the dyslexic and the controls here. So what is with the irregular condition? So we have here in red the controls and in orange the dyslexics. So when we looked at this data pattern, well, we were intrigued by this peak at around 2.4 hertz and um, surrounding frequencies. What were emerged for the, con for the controls, but not or very weaker for the dyslexics. So in light of this data pattern that obviously we hadn't predicted, we went back to our primes and to the power spectral density for the regular and irregular, here in particular, sequences. And when we zoom in from the red line that you see in the plot that I showed before, well, there is more energy around 2.5 hertz in the irregular sequences. Well, by accident, it was not manipulated. But it looks as if the controls try to extract some regularity in this irregular sequences, while the dyslexics do not. So here we have this coherence analysis for the controls in contrast um, to the dyslexics around this frequency. So as I said earlier, well, we didn't manipulate it, we didn't predict it, we observe it. But then looking at the literature, it was interesting that we found a study by Simone Falk with Daniela Schön. They also had a a different type of rhythmic priming paradigm, what was not on a global level, but mm, that's not important for the present purpose. It's just, it's, um, they had a regular Q, rhythmic Q, and an irregular rhythmic Q, and obviously their analysis was interested uh, on the influence of the regular Q on the language processing afterwards. But here you have the power, the um, analysis of the rhythmic Q and the coherence for the EG. And if you ignore the dark, uh, black dark line for the regular Q. What is interesting is to look at their irregular Q. Also, by accident, their irregular Q had more energy at a given frequency. And then if you look at the results for the coherence analysis for the EG, 
you also see a peak in the light gray that is exactly in the same range. So these were also were not patient population, but just simple control um, non musician participants. But also here is a result pattern that suggests that the brain seems to try to extract some regularity in an irregular cue or in our irregular music. And um, while well, stating now, now it will be interesting to actually manipulate it, to have different types of irregularities or that perhaps perceptually sound irregularly similar, but underneath you have different regularities and then see on the one side for the normal participants, well, what is the regularity or the coherence that emerges in the brain? And then what is with the deficient population like the dyslexics? When do they also track some more regularity in an irregular pattern? So my original question, I, I still say yes, okay? I can, we can show an influence of the rhythmicity, rhythmicity of the musical prime for subsequent syntax processing. But now I want to say the big bad is because for an up to now everything what I've showed to you is a comparison between regular and irregular primes, right? So it's a relative difference between the two. So we followed um, similar to what has been done in psycholinguistic priming research or even in music priming research um, Stephen referred to earlier. It's comparison between related and unrelated and here it's regular, irregular. The problem is that we don't know whether this difference is due to a cost due to the irregular prime or is it really a benefit or an advantage of the regular prime or a mixture of both? Okay, and this question obviously is particularly important for perspectives of training on rehabilitation. We would like to believe that it's a benefit of regular, but we have to show it because up to now it's just the difference between regular and irregular. So the next question I want to propose you to talk about is, does a regular musical prime facilitate subsequent syntax processing when it's compared to a more neutral baseline condition. So it's the same type of priming paradigm, so I have a prime followed by the grammaticality judgments, but the regular prime now was compared with different types of baseline or more neutral, rhythmically neutral primes. In the first experiment we choose environmental sound scenes without temporal regularity, so playground sounds or street sounds without um, uh, conversation or language of speech. And in this study we compared CLD children with control children much for chronological age. Um, and here you have the results so plotted again as D prime for the grammaticality judgments and we see benefit or better performance after the regular prime in comparison to the irregular prime and particularly for the well, SLI or DLD children, I didn't change the graph, um, and the control children were very good. This one baseline sequence that then confirmed there's a benefit of the regular and it's not just a disturbance of the irregular in the previous data patterns I've shown. You can also uh, use different types of baseline comparisons. So in, in another set of studies we used the textural sound prime. So we wanted to go also with musical material um, but without underlying beat or pulsation. So we went with contemporary music without regular uh, rhythmic, uh, without rhythmic regularity. So if you're familiar, it's music like by Ligetto or Roger Reynolds or others, just to give you an idea. So it's floating tempo spectral um, music. Okay. Also about 36. And we tested here now typically developing children only um, and we compared so the grammaticality judgments after the regular prime in comparison to the textural sound music primes. And we see the better performance after the regular prime in comparison to the um, textural sound. And then finally, well, an obvious baseline comparison is to use silence, right? What is, what is the performance of the children after a silent period to judge the grammaticality? And here we also test the typical uh, developing children and we see that the silence condition led to the same performance level than after the textual musical sound primes and um, thus lower performance than in the rhythmic. And in the Hungarian, Hungarian study of um, Iniko I mentioned earlier with the DLD kids, she also used the silent period and she has irregular and silent at the same level and the benefit of the regular prime. Um, so this is a promising finding in regard to the use of musical primes in training, okay, in training or simulation settings. Um, up to now we don't have to run a full training studies, but we did a first 
approach to introduce musical primes in uh, speech therapy sessions that were targeted to train syntax processing. So we had training sessions uh, for the speech therapists that were punctuated with regular primes or with baseline primes that here were the environmental sounds. And in the training sessions that the children um, did over eight weeks, there was classical exercises on grammaticality judgments or sentence compre syntax comprehension. The only difference with the classical speech therapy session was that um, after a couple of exercises, well, they listened to the uh, musical prime, either the regular musical prime or then the control and environmental sounds, did more exercises, the prime, and so on and so on. And we had a crossover design. <coughs> you will see it was a rather small group for this first um, study. Um, and the kids started either with the baseline primes or the regular primes or the other way. And what do you see with test one, test two, test three? Well, we tested them on performance um, on the targeted, perform, targeted capacity, ability, grammaticality judgment, syntax comprehension, but also on tasks that, like, that require phonological segmentation, like a repetition of words or non-word tasks. Non-words, what is a classical task used by the speech therapist. Well, we also had some attention and memory tasks, but I won't talk more about this. <clears throat> In this study, we didn't test that uh, children with developmental language disorders, but we went with the different populations, so hearing impaired children with cochlear implants. This population is interesting because for these children, um, so reported that they have syntax processing deficits that can be seen in speech production and in speech perception. And Conway proposed the hypothesis that there's a more general impaired cognitive sequencing capacity because of this um, uh, deprivation of sound during one period of the development. And also, there are some studies reporting difficulties in rhythm processing in this population. So a similar overall pattern of this population to the one I have described earlier for the DLD children. And as I said, well, we, here we just had 10 children, but um, uh, it's the first approach that was promising, as I will show you. And I show you here the, uh, for the three main tasks, the grammaticality judgments, the syntax comprehension, and the word sort of word repetition before and after the training session. So as you can see, when after the regular prime performance increased and um, the children were better, um, when, the when the syntax training they had was punctuated with the regular music in contrast to the baseline condition, and that a similar pattern was observed for the syntax comprehension task, a bit more, less strong, and also for the word, uh, pseudo word repetition. As I said, it's a um, uh, rather small group, so I propose you to also look at the individual data patterns, or so one bias, um, one child, the difference post-training, pre-training, and when the bar goes up, there's improvement from before and after for the three different tasks. And even if the sample size is small for now, the congruence of the results across the kids are rather encouraging for the use of the temporal regular musical primes, which might improve the benefit of this morphosyntactic training session in the children with the cochlear implants. <coughs> so we have the benefit of this auditory rhythmic stimulation on language processing, and I showed you mainly data now on the syntax processing, so with the grammaticality judgments, or then this first little um, training intervention study on the CI patients. More recently, um, together with uh, Rainer Gordon and, um, and Anna Feivish in, in Lyon, we were interested in sentence repetition performance in DLD children because sentence repetition is one of the diagnostic criteria where these children have particular difficulties. The paradigm was similar to what I've presented before, so it's either a regular or irregular prime, and then they hear a sentence, have to repeat it in the six, six times. And the sentences were either subject relative clause sentences, more difficult object related ones, or some filler sentences. And we then coded the production of the children for the grammaticality correctness or the syntax fidelity in comparison to the um, target sentence. And what we observe is the performance, um, obviously performance is worse for the DLD children than for the TD um, age much um, children, but both groups benefited from having heard a regular prime before um, doing the sentence repetition prime in comparison to an irregular prime, what we used in the study. And what I want to detail now, we have first data on a syllable segmentation task in, uh, or syllable segmentation word in reading. So all these tasks 
require sequencing and segmentation, what um, integrates in the explanation that I had, um, or the hypothesis I developed at the very beginning of my talk. But I want to add another but here. So what is if all these benefits that we observe, might it be just a general arousing effect that is beneficial to whatever task you put afterwards? I hear select syntax and sentence repetition, right, or syllable segmentation, but might it be just arousing and help the children to do whatever? Now we have a set of data to actually be to able to respond no, um, because in a set of comparison tasks, we didn't find a benefit of the regular prime. And we had non-linguistic control tasks, like for example, in the last study I mentioned um, on the sense repetition, we had a visual spatial search task. So you have this sheet with all the animals, with um, different um, pictures, and you have to cross out all animals. So it's a visual spatial non-sequential search. And then also um, in other studies, um, with Rainer, you had US Youth Math task, and then you had this nonverbal um, Stroop task, not showing a benefit for regular prime. And this result pattern was also observed for other linguistic tasks, like this Hungarian study, they had a picture naming task, or um, we have compared it also to a semantic evocation task where children had to pr produce um, um, speech descriptions. Um, but in either of this, list of tasks we had the benefit of the regular prime, like for the, the task I presented at the beginning. So I come back where I started. <laughs> it's tasks that require sequencing and um, segmentation, and we propose to explain it in the framework of dynamic attending, with the idea or the hypothesis that the regular events of the musical prime provide predictable cues. Okay? And they, these cues might boost and entrain these internal oscillators and then benefit temporal attention and then to temporal sequencing and segmentation, which then helps to improve or uh, support performance in the different tasks that require sequencing and segmentation. <clears throat> and this research line I have proposed, we can also tie it um, to a um, different research domain that Osha Goswami has proposed with her temporal sampling oscillatory framework for dyslexia or then for extension to SLI or, or DLD, um, where she proposed that sequencing segmentation temporal attention on different levels of more or less fine-grained, which level you, um, you consider in the speech signal, and then having the impairment in these populations. Okay. So we have this effect of auditory rhythmic stimulation on language processing, um, which we propose to explain in the framework of dynamic attending, postulating this benefit of the predictable cue on temporal sequences, what is relevant for language processing via the internal oscillators and the temporal attention. Okay. And I propose to make the link with um, Osha Goswami's work, but it can also be linked to findings from other research investigating the cortical oscillatory dynamics directly either in speech perception or in rhythm and beat perception. Um, and now we started to go also in this direction, analyzing the EEG signal, um, uh, <laughs> EEG signal of here where was a study with the dyslexic adults together with uh, Laurel Trainer and Andrew Chang where we presented isochronous tone sequences um, regularly spaced at 500 milliseconds intertone uh, interval, so two hertz. And based on the work that Laura Trainer has done um, earlier with Fujioka or Laura Cirelli, um, analyzing the beta oscillations. So being interested in how the power of this beta analysis evolve over time. And that they have previously observed is that this beta power after a stimulus, on, um, stimulus onset decreases. And then over time, while waiting or expecting the next event, this power power increases, 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 up to the next tone that occurs. <clears throat> and we, if you look at the blue line, we replicated this finding in our control participants. You see uh, as an example, just to illustrate, you have the two, two tones of the sequence, the isochronous sequence, and you have the power of the beta oscillations after the uh, tone of the sequence decreasing, and then increasing uh, as a reflection of the temporal prediction mechanisms what before the next tone occurs. And when you now look at the red line, there's, that does not observe for the dyslexics. Right? So we have an um, indication suggesting some <coughs> altered predictive timing in this population. And this result we found um, 
um, particularly interesting if we tie it to another population. Um, when you, and we think we will have more about it later this afternoon with Devin McGauley, but in children with stuttering. As Edgell et al. have shown that the phase of the beta power fluctuation was opposite for the children with stuttering in comparison to the control. And again, this is a population that has also impaired auditory rhythmic um, processing capacity. So again, another parallel with another um, population. So I talked about rhythm processing and speech and music, okay? And I proposed mainly the dynamic attending theory, but it's not only this framework that has been interested in um, discussing or proposing mechanisms underlying rhythm processing and speech and music. To close now, I want to share a framework that we have proposed with Anna Fivias based on multiple frameworks that have been proposed in the, in the literature and that have been developed previously so about music, speech, and temporal processing. Um, and I put here the main list of the theories that we have um, um, selected. So we have more general opera hypothesis of Annie Patel, and then different frameworks, more focusing on the timing, or then making the link with perception action coupling, or both. Um, so we had a look at this and put them all together, and the idea was to find a common denominator. Um, what are the underlying um, processes in the rhythm processing independently of the material that we could propose and put together. Um, so we propose the prison framework that is like a combination of everything, processing rhythms in speech and music. And what came out as the main underlying mechanisms that are highlighted over the different theoretical frameworks is the necessity for precise auditory processing. So the ability to discriminate very small deviations or changes either on the time dimension or another dimension. The tracking of auditory rhythm um, that is likely to underlie the perception of music and speech, um, with then the question about synchronization, entrainment, and neural oscillations I mentioned earlier. And then sensory motor coupling, so the connection between sensory and motor cortices. So lying these three um, underlying mechanisms and their connection between them because mm -hmm, they are um, necessarily not, uh, they are not independent, now could bring new investigations for fundamental research, like studying the normal functioning of these, but also the impairments, which brings us then the connection to the implied research, like the different time and deficits that have been reported in different developmental disorders. So I talked about dyslexia, and DLD, a little bit about stuttering. We hear more about it um, this afternoon, but in, also in other developmental disorders. Um, how the involvement of these three mechanisms are altered then in the timing deficits for these populations. Then also suggesting um, to the use of music training program um, to complement speech therapy and aiming to boost the underlying processes or reduce the deficits in the different components and provide um, benefits for the children. So based on the various results that I briefly reviewed, the framework I just mentioned, um, let us, together with other results with um, uh, Rainer Gordon's team, to uh, propose this atypical rhythm processing hypothesis with the idea that if there's atypical rhythm processing in early infancy or at, at birth, might this define a risk factor to develop developmental disorders um, and then obviously the question which one for which combination, but already stating it, that an atypical rhythm processing could be a risk factor for this development. And one example when you think about atypical rhythm processing um, that I want to end on now is when you think about prematurity. Okay? These babies have then are born and have an absence of rhythmic environmental sounds early in development in comparison to a normal um, birth and normal pregnancy, which suggests the hypothesis of disturbed auditory temporal processing capacities, which might then link to a risk of impaired development of general cognitive ab abilities later um, in life. And we are now just studying, uh, starting a new project with uh, Laurel Trainer and Zaha Mugimi in, in, uh, in Amiens in France. We want to investigate the beneficial effects of a musical intervention program in the NIC. 
So the general idea is that the um, babies during that time at the hospital will have a music rhythm intervention targeting on the rhythmic dimension and then being tested pre and post and then follow up at three months up to um, 18 months. So for today, I don't have any data. I just can announce that we have two open postdocs positions for this project. And I wanted to add this project also because it directly comes out of the more basic fundamental research, the theoretical development that we have done also with Rainer Gordon, and then having this more um, applied um, intervention study that came out of the different projects. Well, to close, I want to thank all my collaborators of the different projects. I've mentioned, well, Rainer Gordon and Laurel Trainer, but then the Lyon team, particularly Anna Feiverge, Nathalie Bedouin, and Laurel and Colette, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, for oh God, very broad uh, talk, many many populations, a lot of data. Okay, so we have uh, 15 minutes for for questions for Barbara. So yep, in the back. Yeah, so, uh, can you use the microphone? Yeah, we need. Uh, can you please use the microphone because there are people on on Zoom who are uh, attending. I was kind of curious about the limitations of what language domains it, uh, the rhythmic prime helped. So I noticed that it was primarily in syntax processing um, and didn't include a picture naming or anything phonological. And given the kind of broad There's deficits in dyslexia primarily being described as naming and phonology, I was just kind of curious to hear your perspective on how you think those specific deficits tie into a rhythm hypothesis framework? Yeah, we started with the, with the syntax task, um, as I explained at the beginning, and then we went to the sentence repetition task where we targeted also the syntactic structure, and that's also an element where the DLD was particularly impaired. Yeah. Um, now we, we open up. Um, uh, we have this uh, reading task where it's the segmentation of the syllables, and um, start to work now, um, want to use non-word repetition where that's phonological um, directly afterwards, or then more broadly, prosodic tasks, right? So we had the first study, but it <laughs> turned out was just too easy for the kids, um, unfortunately, um, to have prosody as a cue for the segmentation of the relevant information, and then even attention directly, right? So uh, attention either ta tapping into the sequential attention tasks, or then, um, more constant uh, or broad visual spatial, but we then would say, well, except if you have a sequential scanning, um, it won't be facilitated, it won't be targeted. Great, thank you. Isabel, yeah. Isabel. Um, I, we can use this one also. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> nice talk, as usual. I mean, of course, I'm like, you know, seeing the second phase of the uh, priming effect. You remember the harmony priming effect. You got it with deaf people. I mean, it was unbelievable. And I have the impression that you, you are doing this now with the regularity in rhythm. And my question is really related to that. If there's some, something so special about auditory regularity, whether on pitch dimension or time dimension, like now, I mean, I between the two phases of your research. Um, that's my question. And have you considered also, and I think you have, um, regularity in uh, another uh, domain like uh, visual flashes? And uh, so it's all related in my mind. So I'd like to have your opinion about that. Um. Well, we went obviously with the auditor modality because of, because of the music and because of the strengths of the um, uh, temporal processing and the precision, well, as you know, in comparison to the visual one. Um, we, with Natalie Bedouin, who's interested in um, going in the visual domain um, because of the deaf children, um, uh, we start to develop an, another way to present um, compare the musical primes with a, a picture that 
starts to appear on the screen, but very predictively, spatially and temporally. So you have like a little mosaic element that occurs um, one after the other to, to reveal at the end a picture. Um, and the first idea we have is that even this regularity seems to have an effect, but less strongly than the auditory. And then the idea would be to combine them um, um, and see whether we can boost it. Um, we were thinking, yeah. I think the regularity is key. Yeah, what I think it's the, dimension? What, um, the other, I think you can strip it down and say, well, that's just regularity then with the clear onsets in the um, visual dimension. Well, hypothesis would be, it might be there, but less strong than the auditory dimension. Here, all the material we have presented, we used just percussive music, right? We had just the um, regularities or the rhythms that were of our interest. Now we have two ideas to continue and get it bigger. It's one is to tie it to the research domain of groove, right, with the movement and having the enhancement with the auditory coupling. So I have more groovy primes than the ones we have on one side. Or then on the other side, integrate the pitch dimension in the music again, where you then have combined pitch and time cues to guide temporal attention over time. So if you think back on Marius Jones' original uh, theory, dynamic attending, you don't have only the time dimension, but you also have the pitch dimension, and both guide your attention over time. And then see whether this can even make it not only a more pleasant experience, but also have it uh, stronger. Um, but then also, obviously, the question to have to control that it's not just because it's more arousing. Um, but it doesn't seem to work for all tasks. What is the good thing is it seems to have to do something with the task that afterwards follows that also requires temporal processing, sequencing, and segmentation. Um. Hi, yeah, great talk. Um, to dial in a little bit more on that, how much um, regularity is important, I'm wondering, so you tested that uh, regular rhythms had a benefit over irregular rhythms, and that regular rhythms had a benefit over like environmental sound or, or music concrete or whatever. Have you tested whether irregular rhythms also, uh, irregular rhythms against environmental sound or music concrete? Because at least in the first case, you can tell that the regularity of rhythm has a benefit. And in the second case, you can, I, I feel like it's unclear there if it's general syntactic integration and uh, sequencing over say, um, auditory scene analysis and streaming or if it's actually rhythmic regularity that's making that difference? Um, I'm not sure whether I understood the middle part. I tried to clarify it, and then you tell mm -hmm. me whether that was a question. So we compared regular against irregular, yeah. regular against environmental sound, yes. uh, regular against the sound textures, mm -hmm. or regular against silence. Yes. Um, so have you tested regular rhythms against environmental sound or, or anything that's more stream-like to yeah, test yeah, yeah. if it's Re not just like you know, syntactic integration or, or segmentation? So we had the regular, uh, uh, regular primes in comparison to environmental sound scenes, um, but not where you had to target a, um, a, specific, a specific auditory event for streaming in the sound scene. It was more like an ambient um, environmental sound situation where you have different sound sources that come and go. Um, so there's some streaming, obviously, but it's not as if you have to track one, one, one target object. But I, I don't think that it's, because um, even the, if you would have melody material like polyphonic music or melodic line with a harmonic accompaniment, um, and it would be, then, then I would see why it could be a, a, a concern. But since here it's the percussive instruments and you don't necessarily follow the different lines as you would do in a scene analysis or in a melody plus accompaniment task, um, I'm, uh, why do you think it would be a, comp um, a comparative mecha mechanism that has nothing to do with the regularity? Um, I, I guess I don't, but I, okay. I think if you, if you have a general environmental sound uh, stimuli or if you have music concrete versus something that is uh, percussive sounds, then you might be working a little bit more on like sequencing and uh, syntactic integration for the percussive sequences as opposed to not working on sequencing because it's more streamlike and it's a bit more of a cohesive stimulus. So I'm wondering if you were to do a comparison that is irregular but percussive rhythmic sequences 
against environmental sound, if you might be able to tease out if it's the rhythmic regularity making the difference or simply that it's syntactic and sequencing integration over ah, okay. environmental streaming. <coughs> Does that make sense? Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, I see. Well, we, we targeted, and I think it's the regularity that is, uh, that is the important element um, that then drives the attention and brings you the resources in the regular spots that you need. Um, We're going to take one chat question. I'm going to ask Susan to read this, please. Sure, so we have Dr. David Huron joining us online, and he said, Barbara, many thanks for your wonderful work. Have you considered the possibility that the benefit of auditory rhythmic stimulation on language processing is attributable to greater enjoyment, so that the facilitating effect of regular rhythms might be due to pleasure? So for example, dopamine release. Um, well, in, <coughs> in the results that I, um, have shown with this other control task, if it would be just related to arousing or to reward or to pleasure, then we would also see the benefits in the other tasks, like the um, animal cross-out visual spatial search task, or semantic evocation task, or the um, object identification task, or, um, so if it would be something general. But the link with the reward, um, I find it particularly interesting if I take it the other way around um, in link to the response that I gave to Isabel earlier, is um, um, going with uh, other types of material, reinforcing, like going with music that is more groovy, if you think about, well, there's a link between um, uh, rhythmic structure and reward processes that can be enhanced if you go into the groovy domain. So in how far you can um, in increase uh, the regularity effect if you reinforce the part that might be linked to the rhythm-mediated reward part. Um, uh, and I think this combination with the uh, uh, rhythm processing and reward processing and the overlap, like having this pleasure of having a prediction and it's fulfilled or slightly delayed or slightly out, uh, differently fulfilled, like on the pitch dimension, um, can be part of the process and could be enhanced. I guess. We have time for one or two more. Yeah, please. Thank you for an amazing talk. I was wondering about the frequency, frequency, the effect of frequency of the priming rhythm. So I think I think you chose two hertz because it's one of the easiest frequencies to entrain for the brain. But I was wondering if there was any other optimal frequencies of rhythm that could enhance the sequence to the semantic linguistic processing even more. For example, two hertz is in sort of the entrainment of the delta range of our internal oscillators, but for example, if alpha or theta oscillators can improve semantic processing even more than two hertz rhythms? Um, yeah, a very good question um, with open, <laughs> open question. Um, what I didn't explain further is yes, indeed, we use the two hertz for two, two reasons. One was that it uh, corresponded approximately to the spontaneous Tapping, um, uh, tapping tempo that uh, Devin McAuley and others had described in, in earlier work. And it was interesting also bec uh, because of other reports that have um, described that two hertz or this 500 milliseconds could correspond to natural speak to packages of two syllables. So helping also to segment your speak, speech signal um, over time. Um, so <coughs> we went for this first and then now we, we started to m manipulate and see, well, can we speed it up? Can we slow it down? Does the effect um, hold or how would it be changed? So stay tuned about uh, uh, these data. Um, and two hertz is interesting, obviously, also because of other data <coughs> from Laurel Trainer's lab or from Usha Goswami's lab, having that the two hertz um, might be like this, um, yeah, like the internal timekeeper on which the better prediction might uh, go or carry on or, you know, um, uh, and so it was the best way to start to already show whether there's a, an effect and now like for the other questions we have to disentangle how um, specific it is for this or should we speed up or slow down um, the language. Uh, what was interesting already is that it hold across the different languages because the original study with the basal ganglia pa patients I mentioned uh, that was in German so we found it in French, and then we had it in English, and then in Hungarian. So um, uh, we can also diverse there that it's not something that's specific to so-called stress-based or syllable-based timing languages. So I think all these mm -hmm. questions tie a bit to, together and are now 
ask for other questions. Like also, what you now try to do is to analyze the identical speech signal after the regular and the irregular prime for the EEG signal and see whether we can see how the analysis of the speech signal is changed um, looking at the oscillatory. Um, right. right. So the universality across language, even further, sort of supports the idea that the two hertz is actually enhancing the internal oscillator, not like just language based, some kind of language area. Yeah, or, or one yeah. language specific. Or, um, That's very um, interesting. So yeah, for the EG data, I would say true. Thank you very much. Um, I know there are more questions, but I have to stick to the schedule. <laughs> so let's thank Barbara again for a fantastic uh, talk. Thanks.